In this video, Min is going to explain how you can troubleshoot EMC immunity problems in your own lab. Min will be talking about the equipment you may need to do all these measurements, uh, so you know what to buy and how to set it up. He will give us some tips what to try, and uh, by the end of this video, we will actually fix an EMC problem on a real product. This video is a recording of my call with Min, and uh, at the beginning of our call, Min will play a short video uh, explaining the EMC problem which we are going to fix. So here it is, here is my call with Min. Okay, so this is the video. Right now I'm not doing any modulation, okay, so it's just continuous um, power disturbance. And you can see here, see if I leave it here, it stopped. Mm -hmm. So what just happened? What just happened was uh, you can see the PCB on the test in this case is used in a small alarm system. So on the normal working conditions, you know, when you power it up, you just hear the, the alarm sounds and then the alarm needs to pass many EMC standards. And one of the standards is immunity standards. And this product basically failed radiated immunity test. So as you can you see do? just now, as you can see just now, I was using a very small PCB antenna, which we used actually from last time we did the radiated emission uh, YouTube video, same, same antenna. And I injected and I pointed the antenna towards the PCB. And on the other hand, on the other side of the antenna, where the antenna is connected to an amplifier, so you amplify some high frequency noise with some uh, amplitude modulate, modulation, uh, AM modulation, one kilohertz. Um, and then you can, you can hear the sound, basically, the, 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 the sound stopped, basically, yeah. Because the radiation from the antenna. Yes, actually, the, the, the video I just played was not uh, AM enabled. So basically just continuous uh, radiation disturbance on the PCB and the PCB stopped. And then I also enabled uh, AM one kilohertz modulation. And then you can actually hear demodulating tune uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the product. So can, so we, if play, I play, can we continue playing the yes. video? So that's definitely not good, right? Since it's a product that should always make some sound. Yeah. Okay. What about if I switch on the modulation? So now I'm doing one kilohertz AM modulation. Hear this. Did you hear that the board actually demodulates the sound? Yeah. So with AM, it doesn't stop the product Im immediately, rather, the board demodulates this one kilohertz signal. As a result, the sound quality has been affected. So this is what we call um, an immunity issue. Mm -hmm. Now, my question is like, is this what can really happen? Like, because you normally don't place boards close to antennas. So yeah. this is like kind of standard test, what everything needs to pass or why we are doing this? Yes, so the standard uh, defines radiated em emission often at a far distance. So that's again back to the same discussion we had uh, in our radiated emission uh, discussion, because I remember at the time you asked, okay, so the radiated emission is actually measured from three meters or 10 meters away, and we measure actually from one meter. It's the same case in this case. The standard defines the uh, distance often is three meters or 10 meters. So representing some radiation radiated field far away from your equipment. Uh, but obviously in a, in a small office or you know, a, a small company, which doesn't have the chamber to do this kind of test. So what we can do is again, using a very small antenna or some other methods to create a near field disturbance. Um, in this particular case, this product was tested in a 
formal EMC test house. So the antenna is met, uh, three meters away or maybe 10 meters away. And then they, they fail the radiated immunity mm -hmm. test. Okay. So basically the mm -hmm. power from the antenna is not very high. Yes. So the basically what happened is in the test house, they set up the antenna and then they used an uh, amplifier to inject noise into the antenna. And then at various locations in the in the in the chamber, they measure the field strength. Then based on the field strength, you can test your product to a certain level. For example, in this case, I think the field strength is 10 volts per meter. But of course, if your product is uh, used in a sp aerospace like a plane or military, they test much higher, 100 volts per meter or even higher than that. Wow. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, very, very strong field. <laughs> yeah. So basically, if the product is uh, is fine, it should not fail this kind mm. of test when you when you place it close to antenna, it still should be working. And that's yes, our exactly. goal for this video. Yeah. Yes. We are going to yes. try different things and to yes. fix it. Exactly. And I, I think also uh, a, a, a very big difference compared to um, previous videos we did together is this time is an actual real life product and we need to fix it, use the most cost effective ways. And also, I think in this discussion, I will try to encourage engineers to come up with ideas that not, you know, because you, you can always fix something using different methods, mm -hmm. but which method is the best, especially considering now we all have component shortage issues, as you probably know. And also we need to, uh, to uh, another point I want to stress is we need to think about the environmental impact because we want to make the planet a better and greener planet. So we need to reduce the waste. So in this video, I think engineers can see, we try many different uh, methods and eventually we, seek, we, we select the best cost effective and best environment friendly methods, in my opinion. Mm. Okay, so let's go at the mm. beginning of your slides and let's see yeah. what you have there. Okay, so I think this is just um, to, to give you an overview of immunity tests, right? As, as we just explained, so uh, the device on the test is a real life product. Um, and when we test uh, this product, th this product actually failed both conducted immunity and radiated immunity. So it is usually but, all uh, connected this... together. Yes, yes. So in this discussion, we want to talk only about uh, uh, radiated immunity, but it's good to show people what sort of uh, immunity test often a product needs to test against, for example. So here basically summarizes many uh, ways of testing a product against immunity. So we have conducted immunity and we have radiated immunity and we have fast transient and ESD. Of course, we have some other tests, but the majority immunity the, the, yeah, the most common immunity tests are all listed here. And again, I just wanted to highlight that to test your product or a PCB you develop against immunity, you don't need to have very expensive setups. For example, to test conducted immunity, we can use low cost setup as shown in here and here. So I, I provide the link in this, um, in this, uh, uh, presentation so people can have a have a look uh, how to set up low cost uh, pre compliance immunity test. Okay. And so that's just on the conducted immunity. With radiated immunity, there are many ways of testing, uh, testing it. For example, in this video, we will focus on using a small antenna as we just showed uh, to test the products or we use a near field probe, which we will uh, also discuss later on. 
And again, you can use a temp cell, which we discussed this device uh, in our previous video. Uh, so you, you can not, not only can you use a temp cell to measure radiated emission, you can also use it to uh, inject a disturbance to a PCB when you put it inside temp mm -hmm. cell. So uh, yeah, these are the general three ways of doing a uh, radiated immunity test. Mm. So basically I would like to point out, uh, comparing to our other videos, where we measured mm -hmm. what the board was kind of sending out. Now we are measuring uh, something what goes or what is influences the board from the outside. And we are uh, checking the behavior of the board if it's still working correctly. And when it's like conducted exactly. immunity, then we are injecting uh, through cables or something, mm -hmm. some noise through mm -hmm. cables, correct? Yes. And uh, yes. when radiated immunity, we are injecting the noise through the air. Exactly. Yes. And electrical so, fast transient. And yeah, we'll move to that. But okay. just on your point, it's very important. Yes, uh, exactly as you said. So in, in EMC engineering, we, we, we found actually, it's very common. Uh, it's, there is a theory called receptory theory. Basically means if your product emits noise at certain frequency, then chances are it will also be, uh, you know, susceptible to noise at the same frequency. So exactly as your, uh, your point, um, so if, let's say if your system emits noise at 200 megahertz, then it is probably, it will fail immunity at the same frequency. <laughs> yes. So then we move to, uh, electric fast transient and the ESD. These two are also very, very important and interesting. So I think we'll leave this topic for another discussion. I'm sure our viewers will also uh, enjoy the conversation of these two topics. But generally speaking, these two tests basically give you a very sharp rising pulse. So for example, ESD, we're talking about 10 kilovolts or 20 kilovolts and the rise time can be only a few hundred picoseconds. So imagine the, the dV over dt of that energy, very high energy, and your system needs to pass, basically perform normal when exposed to an ESD event. So this and, is the uh, classical yeah. example when someone is touching something and there is the spark between finger and board, and your board still oh. should work. Exactly, exactly. and. And there are many uh, interesting failures or uh, associated with ESD. I personally uh, always enjoy working on an ESD problem because uh, it is always somehow related to your grounding uh, grounding structure, in my opinion. Mm. And EFT, electric fast transient, is similar, um, but the rise time is not that uh, fast. Normally, it's five nanoseconds rise time, uh, so it's simulates in a, in, a, in a scenario, for example, if you, uh, if you, you power your system using a, a, a single phase power supply and in the same supply line, there is a motor running and all of a sudden that motor is switched off. Then there is a big voltage, what we call kickback voltage mm -hmm. or back EMF voltage. And that voltage often is two times or three times of its normal uh, voltage. So um, this test basically simulates that kind of scenario. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, okay, so because today we are looking at uh, radiated immunity. So here is the normal test setup where, as you see, uh, this, say if we send this product into a EMC test house, that's how they test it. So you have a DUT um, could be an uh, alarm in this case or could be uh, some other product. And you have an antenna and the antenna will be placed three meters or 10 meters away from the DUT. And you, all you need is an amplifier and a signal generator. And really depends on the frequency range. Uh, often these days they test from 18 megahertz all the way up to six gigahertz. Mm -hmm. So you need different antennas for different frequencies, same as before. And as you can see, for this product, they need 10 volts per meter field strength, and they need amplitude modulation. So that's 400 hertz and one kilohertz modulation. Yeah. 
And the product in this, this particular product is very interesting because it failed um, only between 1.2 and 1.4 gigahertz. So imagine, it's very interesting. Imagine you, you sweep the frequency from 80 megahertz all the way up to six gigahertz, and it only fails at this very narrow frequency range. So that's where it starts getting very, very interesting. Mm. I would like to ask, how do you know mm. what you have these test levels correct in volts per meter? Can you measure it somehow? Yes, we can. So in the test house, they will always, you know, re routinely, regularly um, monitor the field strength during, during you know, normal calibration process. So they will always check that, you know, the field strength at normally they select a few points, making sure each point has the same field strength. And as we will demonstrate later, using our low cost home, home you know, office, uh, a low cost setup, we can, uh, we can do the same. We can actually achieve quite high field strengths. Yeah. But can you measure it, like how high it is? Yes, we can. Okay, so that's uh, where the normal, you know, like the proper test house, how they set up. So for an engineer working on their product, sending the product to a test house will cost money. So often we will come up with low cost uh, benchmark test setup. So this basically shows how I set up um, the tests. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, wonder, I wanted to move this thing, <laughs> this one. How can I move it? Oh, don't worry. Uh, Just... uh, okay. Yeah. I, yeah. Because it's blocking. Anyway. Okay. So, so as we mentioned, there are three ways normally we can use, right? We can use the TEM cell, as we explained, we can use this small PCB, or we can use a, a near field probe, mm -hmm. okay? And they are exactly the same. Basically, all you need to do is you connect one of these to an RF amplifier. And the best is that the RF amplifier needs to have AM modulation. So in this mm -hmm. case, the one I'm using has one kilohertz you know, amplitude modulation functions. So I can enable that function for this particular test. And the RF amplifier needs some signal inputs. And if you have a spectral analyzer that have the tracking generator option, which is here. So basically the tracking generator basically just sends some uh, defined frequency signals. You can use the tracking generator output function as an input to the an amplifier and then basically set up the test setup as it is. Uh, for me, because I do this quite often, so I also have a special software that I can control the frequency range and amplitude. Uh, so that's just an add-on. But you know, if you are you have limited budget, you can set it up using uh, one of these uh, amplifier and uh, a signal source. Signal source could be a spectrum analyzer or could be something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So spectrum analyzer, there is also the uh, generator automatically always included? And you have to pay a few hundred dollars for this extra uh, function. But most of the uh, time, when people buy a spectrum analyzer, they will always have this tracking generator function because it just for a few hundred US dollars, you can achieve much more function compared to the one without it. Mm. I'm just curious. So if you have this kind mm -hmm. of RF amplifier, can't you like, you know, send stuff outside of your house? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a very, very good question. Actually, I think, because uh, uh, I, you know, sometimes I make uh, YouTube videos and that's the question people ask and say, you have to be careful not to interfere your your neighbor's <laughs> equipment. So yes, I think I have to stress this point in here. Uh, so for this video, we do the demonstration in a, in a, in our room environment. But most of the tests, I was setting up everything in a in a small tent I have. So making sure that the noise is not polluting my neighbor neighbor's uh, equipment or a TV. <laughs> oh, so you can buy like a small tent where you put all the devices and, and you ground yes. the tent so it doesn't go. Exactly. Up. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. 
okay, so here uh, to answer your question, <laughs> uh, there are a few things I need to again point out. So this is uh, uh, what we call a field meter. So this meter basically oh. measure the, the the field. Yes, yes, exactly as you asked. So, um, but but to to measure the field, it has a you know uh, always has its own bandwidth. So the so the sensor I have here, this is called three axis sensor. So it can measure x, y, z basically. Um, it has it can only measure up to one gigahertz in this case. I, well, you can always buy more advanced versions, but for me, this one only measures what, uh, up to one gigahertz. So, um, so I'm just using this uh, field meter and I measured the field strength. For example, if I use the setup described pre previously and I point this antenna about 10 centimeters away from this, this uh, sensor, you can see here the reading is about 26 volts per meter mm -hmm. so a lot higher than 10 volts per meter yeah and um and if i use this small loop as you can see this is just a simple magnetic field loop and i hold it very very close to the sensor and you can see the reading can be as high as 42 or 45 volts per meter so that's a very strong localized field yeah it? it's very localized yeah mm. and it's always for the frequency what you are generating correct okay. yes exactly so it's you know this is useful information because we know that use the local setup we have at least we, we should be able to to reproduce the failures that uh, the test house sees mm -hmm. i think you know compared to emission tests, as we discussed previously. In this case, we really need to reproduce the failure to fix the problem, isn't it? Let's say if we cannot reproduce the, uh, the AM modulation, the, the sound, the tone change, we cannot fix it because we don't know whether we apply some change it will fix. So it's always critical to, to make sure that we inject some noise and the product performs differently until we fix it so the product performs normal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask, when you are measuring mm. these fields, do you need to also set frequency on this special device? This special device, um, no. You can measure uh, a very wide mm -hmm. uh, uh, band, uh, bandwidth, yeah. Um, so often, you know, you can test, say in this case, maybe I supply one gigahertz um, you know, a wave, and then I can uh, apply 500 megahertz and I test it again. So each time it gives me a reading, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, it won't tell me, it won't tell me the frequency. So it just gives you the idea of the, the field strength, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I always learn about new devices in when we're making <laughs> videos, video. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So that's, that's basically how it works. Okay. So Till now, I think we 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 demonstrated that using a low cost setup, you can actually reproduce the same failures a product face it, you know had in a test house. So now we can we can see okay how we can use this low cost setup to help us troubleshoot basically. Uh, so yeah, this video we demonstrated. Okay, I think here is interesting. So the first step is to use an antenna and basically point the antenna towards the PCB and we know, okay, it failed. We can hear it. Now, the next step is which part of the PCB actually failed. And to lo locate, in this case, which part, we need to introduce a near field probe. Mm -hmm. So this is the near field probe. And near field probe is very, very common. You know, we use this for measuring uh, emissions. For example, if you have a switch mode power supply, as we demonstrated in the past, we just use the near field probe connected to a spectral analyzer and we can see the noise. But in this case, again, rather than picking up noise, we are injecting noise into this near field probe. So we inject noise into this near field probe and then we move this probe over the PCB and to see where the the PCB, the, 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 you know, the performance changed. So basically that's the idea behind it. So it's much more focused than the big antenna. 
Exactly, okay. much more focused. Yeah. So here is how it works, right? It's very simple. It uses magnetic coupling, uh, basically. So as you can see, if you have a change of voltage alongside this, this uh, length of the wire, because of the induction, you know, the uh, magnetic induction between the two wires, the other wire will have some voltage change as well. So it just uses this simple uh, physics. And imagine if I hold this magnetic field probe over my PCB and say, if you have a, a trace or track, which is a problem, problematic trace, then when this probe is holding against that same trace, it will cause some issues for the PCB. So that's how we use these techniques to locate the, 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 the problem, basically. Sometimes it's a thin trace or track, or it could be a, a, a microchip. Yeah, so that's the techniques we're using. Mm. Okay, and this for strongest field is when it is in parallel with the antenna? When you, yes, when you put indeed. it like, uh, if you would rotate the wire 90 degrees, then it would not be so strong. Yeah, yeah. so the idea is because because it is not, and uh, it has its, uh, it's a good one, yeah, because it has advantages and it has disadvantages. The advantage is you don't have any physical connections, right? Because it's all induced. So you don't have to worry that using this can short your circuit, for example. Um, so that's the advantage. But the disadvantage, as you said, it really depends on how close you place this near field probe to your board, because if you just move a little bit away, then the coupling factor has reduced quite dramatically. So often, you know, when you use it, making sure that you, you hold it against um, the, the PCB and make, so that gives you the maximum coupling between And you need to also rotate it different. You rotate, very, very important to rotate because again, this is based on uh, magnetic field in induction. And when you, when you in induce a voltage, on a, on, a, on a trace by magnetic fields. It has its own polarity, right? Because imagine if you have positive and negative, then you will induce a positive negative. So it's important to rotate because then you can check because sometimes a circuit can be susceptible to a voltage on one direction, but in, immune to noise on the other direction. So as you said, yes, rotate 180 degree to always double check. Very, very important. Mm. Okay. And the failing part will be exactly, which is in the like parallel and very close to the antenna. Yes. So again, this requires some, some, some um, sort of practice mm -hmm. in practice. Okay. So yeah, yeah. I, I have this very um, uh, small article, which you, you know, people can click this link and it basically details how to use it properly, you know, because I think I think you actually created video yeah. about this. I've seen, didn't you? Yeah, I think I think so. I, I can't remember now. Yeah, I created a few short videos on my YouTube channel. Uh, yeah, I might have. Yes. So so, yeah, um, if if you uh, if people are interested, they can always uh, click this link and find uh, find the details. OK. Mm -hmm. Mm. Okay, so um, yeah, again, I can't show the details of the PCB, so I have to blur the PCB, but it doesn't affect our discussion. Using this, this method we just discussed, we actually locate where the problem is. And it is a very, very interesting one. Interesting in the sense that there is, there is a story behind it. So basically, I think lots of people nowadays are facing the same issue as we discussed the global supply chain disruption and shortage. So this is a company, they used this original IC, right? So it's a DIP16 package, five volt supply, always good for many, many years, no problem. But then because of the mm -hmm. component shortage issues, now they have to design another uh, uh, subsystem, let's say. So they, they managed to find uh, ARM M, I think it's M0 Cortex based chip. And it is, of course, powered by 3.3 volts. And you cannot put this on this original footprint. 
So what they come up with is they design a very little PCB that they put the new chip on top of the PCB and then between the PCB and the original PCB, they, they connect using uh, the, the, the leads basically. So that's why initial that you know this original product has never had any issue but once they change their design and by law if you change your designs like this you need to test mm -hmm. the ems again yeah it's good and they I did think, it yes indeed indeed i think it's a very responsible manufacturer because they really tested and then they found out oh, actually we had issues so um yeah so it's again it raises a point yeah every change these days we make don't assume it will pass EMC mm -hmm. because it, it, in this case you know, it may it may mm -hmm. not be even about passing EMC, but it may be about future yeah. problems because if it's not passing EMC, mm -hmm. it means there is something wrong anyway, and they may yes. ship hundred thousand pieces and I don't know fifty thousand may have problems and they will return yes. people will return it or something. Indeed. Uh, yes, I, I think another point I, I like to to uh, to make is, you know, compared to emission problems. Say, if your product emits noise, you can upset other equipment, but at least your product functions well. But if your product suffer from immunity issues, then it can be perceived as a quality issue, right? So that's that's another problem. So. You don't want your customer to say, "Oh, your product actually, uh, you know, is not working." So I, I think that's label, not, I not, not, yeah. yeah, definitely, definitely. Mm. Okay. So okay, so mm, so these are the, the the issues we found. Okay, so it's the new board somehow has immunity issues. Okay, so I think here. We are quite clear now, so we know that where the problem is, we locate the victim, in this case, is a new IC on a small daughter board. But we still need to answer a few questions. The first question is why it only fails between 1.2 gigahertz and 1.4 gigahertz, but not other frequency range. And it's worth mentioning that this product also fails conducted you know, immunity as we discussed, and also at lower frequency range, 200 megahertz, it also failed. But the fix of this is easy because for 200 megahertz noise, uh, you need uh, an antenna to pick up the noise, you know, uh, and the antenna needs to be big enough. So actually, I think it probably is easy to explain here Okay, so as I said, the product itself, um, so it fails 1.2 and 1.4 gigahertz. It also has 200 megahertz problems, but the 200 megahertz problems was fixed before the product was sent to me because they tested it and then they found using a ferrite on the, on the mains cable basically fixed the problem. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have these 200 megahertz issues, but I'm using this as a nice demonstration to show where the problem is. So you can see here, I have this table. This table basically tells you uh, the length of a cable and frequency. It's, it's uh, you know, the frequency it is associated with as an antenna. So we always use um, this value, three uh, to the uh, 10 um, power of eight as a, uh, speed of light, but often in reality, you know, we were talking about the wires and PCB. So the so the, uh, the 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 speed of light actually is slower than than it travels in in, in free free air. So often I use 0 0.7, 0 0.8 as the uh, factoring ratio. Mm -hmm. And and based on this simple lambda equals c multiplied by, by f. Um, sorry, c equals lambda. <laughs> C equals lambda multiplied by F, we can work out, for example, at 200 megahertz, one wavelength is one meter, and a quarter of a wavelength is 0.26 meter. So that's 26 centimeter. So that's about this size. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, the, the product's main input 
uh, wire is about 20, 30 centimeters. So it's very clear. So if the product failed at 200 megahertz during the radiated immunity test, it's probably due to this main wire. Mm -hmm. So that's why they, they, they send this to the test house and the test house say, oh, uh, we, we use this uh, ferrite, which is basically common mode impedance. They put it on the wire and then they suppress the noise and it's, it's performing okay. So that's that's passing, but and we know why, because the, the mains wire is an antenna, okay? The mains wire is an antenna for, for noise at 200 megahertz. So for these lower frequencies around Mm. 200 megahertz and this kind of megahertz mm. people should be looking for cables that's yes where probably yes. the problem is yes indeed so generally speaking you know from 30 megahertz to 300 megahertz often most of the time you you should look at cables you know from 30 20 centimeters up to two meters these mm -hmm. can easily will radiate and also pick up noise at mm -hmm. this frequency. Um, but using the same equation here again, for this system to suffer from problems at 1.2 gigahertz, we're looking at a quarter wavelength at four centimeters, four centimeters. So that's very, very short. Why we so, are looking um, for quarter wa wavelength? I guess the problem can be in all three things. On, in all yeah, three so, lengths. Yes, the the most common one is half wavelength and a quarter and a quarter wavelength. Mm -hmm. Half wavelength, um, it, it's you know, it's half wavelength. Uh, as I often said, uh, you have to the, the boundary conditions are different with a quarter wavelength. The the majority of the uh, emissions or immunity issues we have is related to a quarter wavelength. A quarter is it because wavelength and if you have like whole length then it's kind of you have there also the positive and negative it can kind of cancel each other but if you have only quarter length then you have like full um, full energy there somewhere yes so this is a very uh, very big subject because it's related to uh, you know uh, things like antenna or voltage standing waveform and you know all these complicated things the way i I see it, I often try to simplify things is a quarter wavelength cable, exactly as you said, you, you have a cable and then you have maximum current at one end. And this current is not differential current. We're talking about common mode current mm -hmm. again. So you have maximum um, differential current at one end and minimum uh, uh, current at the end, at the other end. And this is because let's say a, a, a very 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 efficient antenna would be say your 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 radio you always have one end is in free space mm -hmm. so so in free space we have high impedance basically and then the other end connecting to your board that represents a low impedance so when you have this kind of unbalanced so you have one end high impedance one end low impedance current tends to flow and when te current tends to flow you radiate and mm -hmm. also you pick up the same way. So that's why a quarter wavelength is very, very common. It's the most common structure on PCB. Um, so often I would pay close attention to a quarter wavelength. Mm -hmm. uh, half wavelength is also important. Yeah. Half wavelength cable is also uh, prevalent, especially, for example, in a system. Let's say you have two PCs or two servers, and then you connect it using a USB or HDMI cable. And then chances are that cable will be a, a half wavelength because mm -hmm. you, both ends of the cable connected to a, a metal chassis mm -hmm. and metal chassis generally a low impedance mm -hmm. but then in the middle of the cable is in free air so again that's high impedance so then you have currents flowing but that's a, a half wavelength mm -hmm. uh, cable mm. okay yeah. so in this so, case the problem mm -hmm. can be like four centimeters like this yeah maybe yes yeah 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 four centimeter, anything close could okay. uh, uh, could be a problem. So uh, yeah, so when we talk about one gigahertz noise, um, yeah, so uh, we have to be careful on the on the whole PCB design, uh, trace tracks and things like that, yeah. Okay, so let's have a look at, uh, at this PCB structure as we discussed, okay? 
Now, I think, I think when we release this video, I might get questions because I, I can see if, uh, if an antenna design guy or an RF engineer would probably have a different view uh, compared with me. But I think the different views actually contribute to the same, same uh, fundamental uh, principle. So because I'm not an RF engineer or, or, or antenna engineer, so I often tend to think it as an EMC issue. So the way I see this problem is I see a little PCB on top of uh, another PCB. So these two have some distance between them. So it, to me, these two PCBs form a capacitor. Mm -hmm. And then, then I look at the, the pin connection, as you can see here. This connection is, is like this long, it's, it's quite long. And I just use some very, very simplified uh, estimation. I think it could introduce 10 nanohenry inductance very, very easily. And, and bear in mind, these pin connections, there's only one pin, which is the ground. That was my volt. question, actually. That's what I wanted to ask. <laughs> if only one yeah. pin is ground. Yeah, there's only one pin that is ground. If every pin is ground, then that's, that might be a, a better you know, scenario. But we only have one pin that is ground, okay? So I just did some very quick, very rough estimation, as you can see here. Um, the, the capacitance between the two PCBs is about picofarad level. And the inductance may be 10 nanohenry. And if we work out the self-resonance of this one picofarad together with 10 nanohenry, then we get a resonance about 1.5 gigahertz. So the, pro the product fails between 1.2 and 1.4 gigahertz. So it tells me something, mm, it could be because of this resonance structure. So the way I treat it is as a resonance structure, but I'm sure if you present this problem to an RF engineer or, or antenna design engineer, they might be thinking, actually, this is a patch antenna because you know, patch antenna is like two patch and uh, they can pick up signals. They, they probably will find uh, antenna structure very, very easily mm -hmm. as well. But, but regardless, because for, for, for antenna to be efficient, it also needs to have to operate at one resonant frequency. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why it's the same, it's the same um, uh, uh, argument, let's say, yeah. Okay, and in mm -hmm. the equation, so C equals... So... So C equals, yeah, um, to the, uh, the epsilon naught, epsilon R, one is relative, one is constant. Mm -hmm. And then A is the area. Mm -hmm. uh, so in this case, I calculate the area and H is the distance. Mm -hmm. yeah, the, the very simple um, equations we get from, mm -hmm. you know, physics book. And the inductance is just some rule. So the rule I use is, uh, is a very... A uh, common rule in EMC engineering, we say 20 nanohenry, 20 nanohenry per inch, uh, but then again, inch is uh, what, three point something centimeters. So you can use 10 nanohenry, one centimeter rule, basically. Mm -hmm. So basically, if we see a one centimeter long uh, length of cable, cable or wiring, uh, we would just say, oh, that's probably 10 nanohenry. So if you have a loop of five centimeters, then you can work out it's, it's going to be a few uh, 10 of uh, 30, 40 nanohenry, let's say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, yeah. I have it's, a question which is not directly mm -hmm. related to this, mm -hmm. but so do you think if they would place at least two ground pins, like one on the one end and the other one on the other mm -hmm. end, that would kind of yeah. break this structure and the resonant frequency would be like much higher? Uh, that's a very, very good point. And uh, again, see later. I okay. like your question because because we cover it. Let's wait until, okay. until we, 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 we This was just yeah, yeah, yeah. my idea because this is very yes. similar to one of my videos with Keith Armstrong. And, uh, and we were mm. talking exactly about this kind of structure and resonance. And he pointed out how important it is to actually put there as many ground connections as possible because it yes. breaks the structure. That's why I ask about mm. this. 
Yes, yes. That's actually one of the first attempts we tried on this on this product. Okay. Um, but it, yeah, but it didn't work. Okay. But I knew why it didn't work. Yeah, but we'll we'll, we'll come across that point. That's good teaser. Okay. <laughs> no, I would like to yes. know why it didn't work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So as I said, uh, the assumption is that that structure we 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 just discussed that structure resonates. Basically, that's the assumption. But how do we prove it? You know, or you, people can just say, are you just talking as if it resonates? I have to see it, right? It's always nice for people to visually see the and the, the resonance. So here I introduce a very, very good technique. And uh, it's, it's, it's not common. Many people don't know about it or people know about it, but never tried it. I tried it a few times and I really, really like this method. So I just have a very uh, brief introduction of this method. And you, you can always find details in this, this link. Uh, I created a YouTube link for this one. Mm -hmm. So the idea is, again, the idea is if you have a spectrum analyzer with a tracking generator function, as I mentioned, then you can buy this device. It's a, a, a directional coupler. It costs less than, I think, about 100 US dollars or 100 pounds. I can't remember. But that, that's just sits in that frequency, uh, that, that price range. And you connect it in a way. So this is the uh, mini circuit um, directional coupler. And if you connect in this way, so the output connect to the tracking generator output and the CPL connected to the input and the input connected to uh, a probe, which is here. I mean, we don't need to discuss the details of it, but I just give you a quick uh, idea of what, what it does. So what it does is you can treat this little loop as a small antenna, right? It says it's a very, very small antenna. And what it does is the signal generator inside the spectral analyzer sends a, you know, a, a, a signal, which is, let's say, from 100 megahertz to two gigahertz, okay? So it's a sweeping frequency uh, of signals. And through this directional coupler, lots of the signals will come to the, the little loop I'm holding. Mm -hmm. And because, because I'm holding this loop in free space, and according to the, the wave um, you know, propagation, may, lots of the waves would hit an open end because this is an open end, and then they reflect back. So the, the wave energy basically reflects all back. And when they reflect all back, it's picked up by the spectrum analyzer. So what shows on the spectrum analyzer is like a flat curve. Mm -hmm. It's a flat curve because what energy you send, you, you receive them. You send, mm -hmm. you receive them. So it's flat. But if you hold, you place this little loop in a, in a structure, let's say the structure could be an antenna. Like a like a small RFID antenna used in a, in a bank card, that antenna has some resonant frequency. Okay, so what happened is that small antenna will suck lots of energy from your loop. So as a result, you you don't see a flat curve anymore. There you will see a dip. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that dip basically indicates at which frequency the structure resonates or the antenna resonates. So this is a very, very interesting uh, technique that wow. I often use to, to locate an antenna structure on your PCB. You can use it actually uh, on your PCB. You just, again, ho hold this uh, loop and then put on areas where you suspect, mm, this, would this place resonate? This, this trace together with maybe a few components, would it resonate? You can check and you can see. So for example, using this method, as you can see, I use a, a smaller loop because you know the whole structure is quite small. So I need to use a very, very small loop. You can see the loop is here. And I place this loop basically around uh, that little daughter board and the main board, basically hold it against, you know, the, like a sandwich, basically hold it inside. And you can see, this is the dip we mentioned. So I start with 250 megahertz, stop at two gigahertz. So if I if I didn't place this probe close to this this PCB, all I have 
is this yellow trace you can see here. It's a, it's a flat yellow trace. But once I plugged into different locations of this little PCB, you can see I have a dip here. I also have a dip here. So if I look at this marker one frequency, it sits at 1.26 gigahertz. Marker three sits at 1.34 gigahertz. So I'm thinking, ah, so this structure actually resonates at this frequency range. So that just proves our assumption, which means this structure resonates, or maybe as an antenna, is efficient at 1.2, 1.4 gigahertz. That's why the system is more susceptible to this noise between 1.2 and 1.4 gigahertz. Don't you need to like put it uh, between the board? Yes. So yeah, it's, it's a good point. The picture shows I put it on the board, which is misleading. Yes, I when I took the picture, I, I put it in the wrong place. Yeah, it should be in between the boards. Mm -hmm. And often I, I put it, you know, like again, as you said, it's sometimes you need to rotate and making sure that you know you measure the like the the, the leads between the the two PCBs. Yeah, because I guess um, when it is I, resonant, I, mm. it can be in different places, a little bit different energy maybe i don't indeed. know yes indeed indeed that's exactly that's exactly uh, uh what happened oh, of course this is a stacked pcb um if you have just normal you know uh, a, a single pcb board but you have some traces after i have seen cases where they lay out a trace and the trace actually forms a very nice antenna and then you put in there and then you can see a dip very big dip wow so yeah, very, very interesting te technique, yeah. Mm. And if you place it on the top of the PCB, then you will measure nothing? Or just the yeah, dip will I, be lower? Yeah, I think I I did remember when I placed on top of the PCB, I, I couldn't see anything. I oh. think, as you said, you have to to find the right location. Yeah, it's because the way it works is sense wave and then, you know, if it sucks the energy, then you see the dip. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's not that... Um, it's quite useful if you know what, what you do, basically. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Okay. Okay. So, so here we, we can keep on this right track because we know, okay, we can prove that uh, the structure does resonate. And the next thing is why, you know, when it resonates and then so all of a sudden it demodulates. Okay. So, uh, these these signals are measured on the gate drive or drive signals to the speaker. So I think mm -hmm. these are just MOSFET. Yeah, if I can remember, they may, they might be MOSFET or small IGBT. I can't remember. And um, and you can see during the disturbance, we have seen there there is a, a what we call ground bounce. So basically, you can see quite clearly here and here, the ground signal basically lifts up. Mm -hmm. So of course, it causes problems, yeah. And so this is, shows you, okay, so we have, uh, first we have a structure that is very bad at certain frequency. And then when that frequency of noise is injected or imposed on this structure, the zero volts all of a sudden started bouncing. So as you said, when we um, when we review the PCB, there was only one uh, ground connection between the daughter board and the mother board. So I'm I'm pretty sure the zero volts on the daughter board will be very different with the zero volts mm -hmm. on the mother board when when experiences uh, noise. Mm. So what is the red uh, red color and blue color? I, I yeah I think the uh, these these two. Oh, uh, I see. There is like minus five. Okay, that's like minus. Uh, yeah, that's negative I think voltage. one is yeah one is before the 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 the, the FET, and then yeah. So okay. one I think is the signal coming out of the chip, and then the other one is the signal coming out of the the drive circuit. Oh, okay. So okay. basically, tells you there's some ground bouncing issue because we we, we can see here the, the ground really missed basically. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the ground bouncing issue we, we want to discuss. Yeah. Okay. So, and of course I wanted to measure the ground bounce 
because it will be interesting to see the ground actually bouncing around. Uh, so I have a set up, right? And as you can see, and this also gives you a closer look at the, at the PCB level. So again, so on the PCB, here's the chip. Here is one point. This point is, is a zero volts as well, but this zero volts is for test point. Okay, so mm -hmm. it's a test point zero volt. And there's a zero point zero volts point on the motherboard. Mm -hmm. So I'm just using a passive probe doing a, a test like mm -hmm. this, right? And I'm injecting noise again using a, a, a near field probe. Mm -hmm. And and I wanted to measure the uh, the ground bounce. Okay. Cool. But I knew yeah, yeah. But I, but I knew, you know, even before I started this, and I knew. First thing is my, my scope is has only 500 megahertz bandwidth and I'm trying to measure 1.2 gigahertz ground bounce. So I knew there's a limitation. And also I'm questioning the whole setup. You know, I know when it comes to high frequency measurement, it is extremely important to use very, very expensive probes. Yes, so that's what I, I was knew... thinking about. <laughs> so I knew this won't work. But but I'm just thinking, I just for you know for 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 fun it's, or for it's still test. good yeah. it's still good to show yeah. and talk about this because uh, mm -hmm. I I've seen many people uh, trying to measure um, signals way above the capabilities of the probe and and the scope and they were like why I'm getting these kind of signals because you are using wrong mm -hmm. tools to measure it mm -hmm. but but. The outcome of this test actually is very, very interesting because you know why? Because it actually answers your previous question about what if I connect another connection yeah. between the two zero volts? And you can see, because I tell you what, uh, the, the, the one zero volts connection, I think sits somewhere here on the left-hand side of the PCB. And then this is exactly at the point you mentioned. So opposite, there's another zero volts. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so, so let's have a look at what uh, is a, again an interesting demonstration. I'll show you. So what I what I found what I found was when I connect when I connect this probe between the two zero volts, one on the daughter board, one on the mother board, the problem disappeared. <laughs> the problem disappeared, and as you can see here, okay, I'm playing this video and I will tell you why. So look. So on the, uh, I think, yes. So what we are seeing here now, if you can see on this video, the blue trace is the, again, the MOSFET uh, uh, signals. Mm -hmm. So on the normal condition, you see like continuous uh, drive pulse, mm -hmm. okay, as, as shown here. You see, okay, now you can see the bounce, ground bounce, because I now injected the noise, mm -hmm. okay? And then on the other hand, my You are my going to arm, connect the probe. Yes, I'm going to connect the probe, okay? I touch it, it's back to normal again. And I lift it, it's problematic. I touch it, it's back to normal again. Yeah, so. You know, I think many, <laughs> many people already experienced this kind of uh, issue because I remember yeah. in some boards like they were not working and then I started measuring and they suddenly started working and so just a little bit of capacitance or something it completely changed everything yes but, but but it's also interesting I think in this case it does give us some hope because it does seem that if we connect the zero volts either using a capacitor, as you said, because I think in this case, it's the parasitic capacitance of the passive probe, which is say 20 picofarad at 1.2 gigahertz is very low impedance, mm -hmm. right? It's not high impedance. So that low impedance path provides a really good path. So the noise is direct around of the chip. So it, it solves the problems. So at that point, actually I was thinking, okay, it is a wrong test, but it does give us some good information. So as you will see, we, we, we actually apply some techniques later on, okay? Okay, so on, on, on the point of these high frequency measurements, uh, yeah, as a, 
I, I noticed that both Tektronics and LaCroix these days have very, very good, what they call isolated probe, but um, these are very, very expensive probes. I, I can't afford to buy this for sure. Generally speaking, um, you can use, uh, or they call, now they call it all fancy names like isolated probes, or in the past could be uh, active probe, fat probe, or you know, many, many sorts of probes. Um, my personal experience with about one gigahertz bandwidth, I use a techniques which is uh, first introduced uh, by uh, Doug Smith, is a famous um, EMC consultant. He talked about a uh, balanced probe in one of his papers. And this is the, uh, the balanced probe I made mm -hmm. uh, based on his work. Um, again, you can click this link and find more details. So yeah, I would probably, I should have used this kind of probe for, for the task. Uh, but I didn't. Yeah. So it means uh, basically there would be no direct connection between the between one pin of the probe and the other one, because they yeah, go. Yeah, I think it's just mm -hmm. it's very high impedance basically. Okay. The, okay. the two yeah the two probe tips for all the kind of frequencies. Uh, that's a good question. It's actually it's uh, I took it back. It's not high impedance. It's not very high. I think if I can remember from the top of my head, maybe just a few hundred ohms, but because they are purely resistive. So it across from, you know, 10 mm -hmm. megahertz to one gigahertz. Mm -hmm. But okay. the problem, but the, 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 I think the point is at gigahertz level, a few hundred ohms is quite high in impedance, you know, because as we said, if you're using a, uh, a very normal passive probe with 20 peak farads parasitic capacitance, the impedance drops to tens of you know, 20, maybe 30 ohms. So if you have 300 or 400 ohms, it's still high impedance in that frequency. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, so far we've talked uh, a lot on the problem itself. So now, now introducing the, 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 the fun bit, which is troubleshoot. Um, in this case, uh, it's not step by step because you know, like compared to the previous videos we make, we we say step one, step two, step three, because each step we made some progress and eventually we solve the problems. For immunity, uh, especially in this case, we only need one approach that can solve the problems. So it's not step based, but it's uh, different ways of solving one issue. Let's have a look. So the first step, uh, well, not, uh, well, I still call it step, but yeah. So I always, I always prefer to use a capacitive approach as you probably noticed, because I love capacitors. I like how, they, how we can use capacitors effectively to help us. So my first attempt is to use what we call capacitive fencing. The, 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 uh, the word fencing means as you can see, this is their uh, uh, chip mm -hmm. they use, and this is their small PCB. And then they try their best to place as many as possible capacitors, basically as a fence um, to circul circulate this, this chip. Okay, so I look at the, uh, the value of these capacitors and I think either nanofarad level or even microfarad level, which are not suitable for high frequency applications. So the first thing I want to do is to make more capacitors, you know, around the board, but using more effective capacitors at gigahertz range. So I picked up uh, uh, one of the capacitors, as you can see, it works very, very well at 1.2, 1.3 gigahertz. So th this is the first step I, I took. Okay. And what, so, what is the uh, value of the capacitor? I think it's picofarad level. I can't remember the details. I think mm -hmm. if you look at this data sheet of this device, mm -hmm. I think either 22 picofarads or maybe 10 picofarad. But for sure, at gigahertz, we need peak farad level uh, capacitors. You can't use nanofarad level uh, capacitors. So um, another point I wanted to, um, to, to point out basically is 
when we are using, you know, especially now we're dealing with gigahertz, you know, uh, frequency noise, how to place a capacitor is very important because you select picofarads, you know, 10 picofarads or 22 picofarads capacitant. But if you put it on a PCB with the wrong techniques, then it's, it's useless because that extra inductance introduced by the connection can just make this capacitor useless. So because this board has already been made um, and I wanted to basically put a capacitor on top of all the other capacitors. So I need to be, I need to take that into consideration. So here shows you two, two techniques. This is what we call piggybacking. It's like, a, you know, you piggyback a capacitor on top of the other one. This works for microfarad or even maybe hundreds of nanofarad capacitors, you can do that. But for the gigahertz, like picofarad capacitors, this means the top one, the one on top has a much larger uh, inductance. inductance. Yeah, so- So you need to swap them. I use, yeah, I use this showing here. Rather than put it on top, I put it on side. Oh, on side. I thought you would yeah. swap them, like you would put the smaller one on the oh, bottom. And... Yes. yes, I can do that. I can do that. Um, but uh, in this case, I just wanted to use this techniques. This is supposed to be better than this. So I do this on each of the capacitor and I basically uh, do, I basically did every capacitor, I think, mm -hmm. basically surround this, this, uh, this chip. And I did a test. It didn't help. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it didn't help. And, and I think I knew why, because all we do is increase the decoupling of the voltage rail of the, you know, of the PCB. So in this case it's 3.3 .3 volts uh, and you just basically enhance the differential mode performance by putting a uh, decoupling capacitors. Um, but the problem we have is actually common modes, mm -hmm. especially with the ground bounds. Mm -hmm. So even if I have lots of energy direct from the 3.3 .3 volts to zero volts, because I don't have a good zero volts ground plane or zero volts structure. So it doesn't help. Um, so that's why it didn't help. And also I need to mention that for this product, neither the daughter board nor the mother board has a solid ground plane. Each board has only two layer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's a two layer PCB without ground or power plane. So everything on the board is just trace and tracks. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to, to have a ground structure um, uh, for this, this, this fix, yeah, basically. Mm. Okay. So that's our first attempt. Even we tried our best, it didn't help, okay? The second approach is as you suggested and as we uh, did the, the, the test, we found, oh, actually, if you connect this end of the PCB zero volts to this point, which is also a zero volts using a very, very short cable that I can find, uh, it might help. So this is what I implemented. And actually this helped, this helped because of course I, if you, <clears throat> when I test it, I, I use, again, use the near field probe. Um, I noticed that if I, you know, the, 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 without this change, without this change, you inject a very small signals, the board failed. But with this change, you inject small level signals, the board actually performed okay. But it's only when you increase the disturbance level, the board failed again. Mm -hmm. So I can see it worked by some extent, but it's not functional, fully functional. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I'm still not 100% confident that this approach would work. Mm -hmm. um, and also this brings another question because the manufacturers have already jumped down and they already ordered, um, actually manufactured, uh, I think maybe 5,000 or 10,000, uh, yeah, 10,000 perhaps PCBs already. So that means 
for each PC, for each product, you will need to have someone to solder mm -hmm. a wire between these two. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's not a manufacturer feasible in my opinion. So I'm thinking maybe we should try some other methods, but this can be a method as you said, okay? Okay, so this is another method I tried because I read in, in some papers, they talked about you know, structure resonance as you mentioned. And when, when we have a resonance structure, because for a structure to resonate, you need to have inductance and capacitance. And if you introduce some lossy component, and when we say lossy component, yeah, yeah we're resistors, we actually we damp the resonance. Mm -hmm. So this is really to try to use a resistor to damp it, as you can see here. Um, but before that, I did some simulation. So sh here shows you the simulation. So mm -hmm. I'm using this 10 nanohenried inductor and one picofarad capacitor, and I'm just introduce some resistors here. And as you can see, without damping, the when when I apply a, a step voltage, the whole circuit just resonates without stop, basically like that. And here the red curve shows you with the performance without the damping. But once you introduce some resistance value like one oh you can say it starts this is interesting to... actually because you, yeah. you place there one ohm and it's still resonating you yeah. place there 50 ohms and yes so you place a 50 ohm you are supposed to damp it really well and actually uh, i can also perform some tests you know there are some uh, simple tests i can perform but in this case i just used uh, a simulation to demonstrate point mm -hmm. so that's why in this attempt, we the first of all, uh, uh, this method, I, I put a 50 ohm uh, res a resistor. So rather than connecting these two volts, two zero volts using a wire, I'm using a, a resistor to see it helps. And the second um, approach, I'm using a 47 picofarad capacitor. This is because I thought, you know, when we use the passive probe, because of the parasitic capacitance, we actually make the performance better. So mm -hmm. I think maybe maybe a capacitor just bypass all the high frequency noise is enough. And the the third approach is I use a RC connection. So this is a resistor and a capacitor in parallel. So I used one kilo ohm resistor and ten picofarad um, capacitor. They all try. They all do pretty much the same thing. They all either, well, actually not the same thing. So the resistor is focused on damping, right? Introduce some lo lossy component and damp to resonance. Capacitor is more focused on high frequency bypassing. So you have to, if you have high frequency noise, it bypass. And this, this RC is a little bit of both, I think. But uh, none of these uh, approach worked. And this is simply because on the daughter board and the motherboard, there's no zero volts uh, ground plane. So you, in, you basically, your noise, the noise cannot be directed to a thin trace or track. It needs to have a, 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 a lower impedance path to go. But on this design, there's no ground plane. So we cannot easily direct the noise to a lower impedance place, basically. Okay, I'm really so curious now how you fix, fix this. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But, but you know, it's, it's always good to try these methods, especially when other um, EMC colleagues, they mention these techniques, you, you, you might as well just try it and validate it in your case. But again, each case has its, its own unique challenges. As I said, in this case, there's no ground plane, so it doesn't work. Okay, on shielding. So shielding is supposed to work. And I had a very, you know, good confidence before I apply shield because I, I was thinking it's a radiated immunity failure. If I put a shield on top of the IC, which I already know the IC has problems, I should be able to block the noise. And I'm using a technique introduced by again by Doug Smith. You can check out this article on his website. And it's very interesting the way he apply his shield. So let's have a look. So on his shield, you can see 
as well. It is an IC, and he just used a copper tape put on top of the IC, and then to to ground it because the shield always needs to be grounded to be effective. So he used multiple grounding points to multiple ground pin of the device because you know for an IC of so many pins. They, they, are, they are like maybe five or six or seven ground pin connections. And that's how he implant, implemented his uh, shield on top of this IC. So I used a similar approach uh, on my uh, case. Um, and also I use this approach. Uh, so I, I actually tried a few approaches. So one is very similar to what he has. And then the other one is I basically cover the whole mm -hmm. uh, daughter board. And I, because there's only maybe two grounding points on the whole PCB, so I just use the one of the zero volts um, connections again to connect the shield to the zero volts. But uh, I'm thinking this is still not mm -hmm. breaking the uh, cavity between the boards, which is causing the resonance. Correct? That's that's right. It's again. This would be maybe just... shielding the the area where is the problem but it would not be fixing the problem no exactly as you said it can shoot the the, the noise but the noise has to go nowhere it cannot be dissipated because uh, otherwise it against uh, uh, physics law so as you said the noise may not arrive at the ic it arrives as a shield and using the connection to zero volts goes to zero volts again, and then again disturb the, the, the zero volts because it's ground bounce again. So that's the challenge I, I, I face when we had PCBs with no ground plane. This is really, you know, challenging for us as EMC engineers. If we got a design that has no ground plane or power plane, it just makes fix impossible because whatever approach that's supposed to work because of the lack of ground plane, it, they didn't work. So that's the challenge we face, basically. Okay, so, so far I tried uh, three, is it three or four now? Four, uh, four attempts. So I, I summarize uh, the options here, the description and the results and comments, but we all discussed. So this is just for our viewers to, to check the, the PDF file later on. Mm -hmm. uh, no, so, stop, stop. Don't don't yeah. don't yeah. Uh, don't uh, tell the solution. I would like to know if uh, yeah. people who are watching, if they mm. come up with some ideas how this could be fixed. So now they have yeah. few minutes yes. before you tell the solution, like uh, yeah. to think how they would fix it. Okay, mm. let's continue. Yeah. yeah, and also on that point, I'm sure. There are, there are many good engineers who will come up with very, very good solutions. Um, but we need to find a solution that, you know, uh, the manufacturer can accept. Because, you know, many times, often, if you show this kind of design to an EMC uh, engineer or EMC consultant, after a few attempts failing to solve the problems, we often just say, look, you need to redesign the the, mm -hmm. the whole board because that's the only way out. Um, but for me, uh, I would always try until the last attempt it is made because. <laughs> okay. So, because, so what yeah. I would try, I when I'm thinking about yeah. this, I would try to disturb the space between these two boards. So maybe put there something, some absorption material. Could this be solution? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Yes, yes. Uh, but but the, the, the thing is, you know, you, but yeah, before we use all options, we should always try because as I said, in this case, the manufacturer have already made tens of thousands of these PCBs. That's why I said if we tell them, yeah, if we tell them to redesign, it's a, a waste of materials, you know, against uh, everything. So let's have a look. Okay, so in our last attempt, this is very, you know, this is by accidental because I was just reading some some application note. And as you can see, this is the application note I read. Very, very irrelevant to this project. And I saw they insert some 
absorption or absorbable sheets between two PCBs. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, wow, okay, it's, you know, it's used for a different application and it's nothing to do with the problem we have. But I was thinking, shall we try the same? So, um, so I contacted the local uh, Worth Electronics uh, sales representative and they were kind enough to ship a few samples. But the, the, the challenges with these kind of absorbable material is it, it's quite tricky because it gives you the data sheet is, 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 is math, everything, you know, it's like mu, mu dash, mu dash dash, it's all related to uh, the property of the sheet. And I, I, being a very practical person, I often don't trust too much on these data sheets. I wanted to really see the performance. So I have to try every sheet he sent to me. And, uh, and of course, to, in order to make it really work, what I did was I cut the sheet because it's quite flexible sheet. So I cut it into small pieces. And as you can see, I need to punch through the holes because mm -hmm. the, the connection has 16 holes. So I punch through the, the holes and I try maybe two or three layers. I think the maximum I can try is two layers mm -hmm. using this uh, material. And I tried two material, two layers of the one material and actually fixed the problem. Okay. And I fixed the problems. So I was very, very happy because I, I, I thought, okay, this, uh, you know, this is really, this worked because use the same test setup as, as before we, we can't hear any noise uh, tone disturbance. So I was really happy until, until until I got a quotation from Worth it's Electronics. Expensive. <laughs> so the material itself is often used for like mobile phone application where, you know, you, you put a, a very thin uh, uh, sheet behind maybe the battery or use in some high performance automotive application. So the, the, the material itself is not cheap. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is I, I noticed when I was making this this uh, this sheet, I need to punch through uh, holes, and you can see the holes I puncture here is pretty bad. You know, it's not ideal. Mm -hmm. So ideally, you need some very good machinery mm -hmm. that can drill the hole um, quite precisely. That uh, process is a value-added process, and I don't want to give you the figure, but the figure is very expensive and and then and then I, I i was thinking to myself i said okay if this worked can we because there there are 16 uh pin you know 16 legs uh, let's see here another thing we could try is to use very small short ferrite you know those little ferrite to put on each of these legs but i was thinking that's 16 legs for each product. That requires lots of manufacture process. So uh, I was just searching all the possible solutions on the, on the internet. And luckily, I found one of this. This is, uh, this is I, 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 I admit, this is really a, a pure luck, luck wow. story. Because it just happened that uh, Fairrite, the company that makes all the Fairrite materials, they happen to have the exact geometry, like the, 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 the plate is called ferrite plates. And they only make, I think, two or three different models. And one of the models is exactly that you can fit in, as you can see here. Now I insert two plates uh, into the daughter board and it just matches perfectly. And it's a much easier, uh, you know, manufacture process. All you need to do is just like, have some uh, labor just to to put, yeah put it and then solder it. That's it, and um, and as you can see, so the these are like only... these are only the plates with you with the holes and you just with put the, them the holes already the pins. Okay, yes, with the holes already made, and uh, I, to be honest, I I didn't ask uh, the company why they have this material uh, this this part. Must be in the in the olden days, you know, when people when they pick sixteen uh, topologies, quite common and popular. Uh, some people had uh, issues. So the, yeah, so this <laughs> I was like, thinking exactly the same. It's not only yeah. the the one product with similar problems. I guess there are <laughs> many more. Yeah. So so they 
they still manufacture these. And as you can see, uh, the, the, the data sheet only gives you the uh, common mode uh, impedance at one gigahertz. But at one gigahertz, you already got 120 ohm, mm -hmm. which is quite high. So I suppose past one gigahertz, it will go like this and then drop. But by the time it drops, it probably already passed 1.5 mm -hmm. gigahertz. So I think at 1.2, 1.4 gigahertz, which is the frequency range we're interested, it actually has maybe 150 ohms impedance. Exactly so for you. Two, yeah, having two, that's 300 ohms. That's a lot of impedance, common mode injection, uh, uh, rejection. So I used two and I performed the test. It passed, you know, I can't see any issues with the test setup I, I, I use. And, and guess how much one uh, does one plate cost? This was my next question. I have no idea. Yeah, <laughs> just kind of have a pure guess. So the previous option works, but we know is I think it it will it will be maybe more than ten US dollars uh, if wow. we decide to go. Yeah. So this one, guess how much it cost? Fifty cents. I don't know. Fifty cents per. Yeah, that's just yeah. Fifty cents. Uh, uh, one part. So if you use two, that's one one US dollars compared to more than ten US dollars. So and I think I talked to the um, company. They are very happy if this actually worked. Um, you know, it's they they because they, they they were prepared. They were prepared to redesign the PCB if mm -hmm. it's necessary, and they they were prepared to do everything. But this is like a really good news to them because it means they can afford more you know, longer time for their next design mm -hmm. where they can still sell thousands of units. They can use it as a temporary solution until yes. they fix it. And so so I told the company, I said, look, um, try, try, well, I told them to send two samples, one with two plates and one with only one plate. Mm -hmm. Because I, I, I told them, uh, I said, look, in the test setup I create in my office, I don't know whether one plate would pass, mm -hmm. but of course, it can pass with one plate, that's 50 US dollar solution. Uh, sorry, 50 uh, cent solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, rather than one dollar solution. And then um, I'm so glad, I was so glad to hear, I think a few uh, weeks or maybe one month back, um, and they said, oh, uh, we passed the test using only one plate. So oh. <laughs> that to me was a, a happy moment. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So yeah. much work with one product. Yes. You, you know what I'm thinking about? You just saved mm. the company a lot of money. Mm. Yes, I did. I did. Yeah. Um, but but that's, um, that's also uh, uh, the key challenge or key requirement of EMC engineering is we need to come up with solutions uh, that can help uh, either our clients or in other cases might be the company to come up with solutions, but also affordable solutions. Yeah, that, that's the, the, the key uh, mm -hmm. requirement. Of the so for them, it was definitely worth to pay you for your service. <laughs> yes, I, 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 I think so. Yeah, and they are, they, they said so to me as well. Yes. <laughs> and, and I think last slides really is uh, for people who are interested in EMC as a topic. This slide is um, more about, you know, we, we need to make the subject of EMC more interesting. Um, I hope the, the, you know, our discussions on the topics of EMC is, uh, achieve that, that uh, goal. Um, but for people who are really interested in, in the subject itself as EMC, um, these are the materials I would recommend. Of course, and now I had a, a small uh, training course on uh, Federic um, Academy. So for people who really wanted to enhance their EMC engineering knowledge, they can uh, uh, click the link and Thank you uh, for have a look. At promoting our <laughs> platform. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. For people who are interested, can click the link and have a look at the course. Uh, I'm trying to make this course more practical as I can. And these are the uh, journals that you can often find in useful information. Signal Integrity Journal. Uh, I think it's Eric Boganti's uh, journal. Very useful. I, I certainly enjoy reading all the articles on there. I also have some articles published there, so uh, highly highly recommending. Um, the uh, in compliance is another one I often publish articles, 
And now I have also have my YouTube video channel. <laughs> so for people who are interested can also uh, have a look. I'm also uh, trying to write some books, um, but for me to write book is a more challenge, <clears throat> more, more uh, challenging task. So uh, I have a book called The Engineer's Practical Guide to EMI Filters. It's not available for, for as a PDF download yet, but it's, it's, it's going to be a free PDF uh, download option uh, very soon. So uh, for people who are interested, I can download it for free. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Okay. Mm. So thank you very much, Min. Again, I learned uh -huh. a lot of new things today. And uh, <laughs> you're welcome. I really hope also uh, everyone who is watching these videos, they are becoming better and better and, uh, yeah. and becoming better in understanding what we are doing, what we are talking about, becoming better in understanding mm -hmm. what is probably happening on the boards and, and also becoming better in finding solutions. Because I feel like it's helping me a lot. Uh, when I create all these videos and uh, and I really hope it's also helping everyone else. So yeah, thank you very much, so Min, well. for You're sharing welcome. all this information because without people like you, uh, other people could not easily learn all these things. So thank you. Yeah, it's been my pleasure. And uh, that's everything for this video. Thank you very much for watching and if you like, you can have a look at Means EMC online course by clicking here.